You are listening to the Love Unplugged podcast, episode 141. Whether you're a service provider or product-based business, the way in which you serve your clients is critical. It can result in referrals, high reputation, brand loyalty, and overall client satisfaction, or if overlooked, it can create a negative impact on the success of your business, possibly even long-term. Today, we're learning what a brand experience is and how we can go about creating an elevated and intentional one for our clients. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. Hey there, I'm your host, Jessica Fergon, and I am passionate about doing the inner work needed to reach your goals. Let me be your guide as we navigate all the fears and insecurities that surface when it's time to step outside of your comfort zone. Along with my knowledgeable guests and industry experts, I'm here to teach you how to reawaken your life purpose and passion and create the steps to turn your intentions into action. Ultimately, my goal is to empower you to rise above those blocks holding you back and start living a life that you are worthy and deserving of. So come on, it's time to slow down, find a comfy spot with your favorite organic tea and get inspired. Thank you for tuning in to the Love Unplugged podcast. Hello loves, today I am joined by the incredible Gracie Thomas. Gracie is the CEO and creative director of the GT Studio, an integrated brand experience studio based in Houston, Texas. She is wellness obsessed, started and sold her first six-figure company before the age of 20, which we will talk about, um, and has been building brands for over seven years. She has a true passion for blending business strategy with experiential design, that's a tricky word, and enjoys working closely with her roster of clients. Whether it's meaningfully connecting brands with consumers, connecting a message internally within an organization, or connecting strategies with profit-driving activities to drive brands forward, the mission of the GT Studio is to connect. In an otherwise digitally focused world, Gracie's passion is maintaining the power of human connection in business, which I absolutely love. I think that is absolutely needed, um, especially today. I mean, even the last two years, everything is just so much more remote, right? On a whole other level. So creating that connection is so important today. So welcome, Gracie. I am so incredibly honored to have you on the podcast as a guest. I'm so excited to learn all about your story, your advice. But before we start, for those that don't know you yet, I would love for you to look, to share a little bit more about you personally. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Um, but yeah, like you said, my name is Gracie Thomas. I am currently living in Houston, Texas with my husband, and we just got a precious little English lab puppy um, named Rocky. So I am deep in dog mom world right now. Um, but we're very happy to be back in Texas. We're from Fort Worth originally and moved up to Denver, Colorado for a while and uh, moved back down here about a year ago. So it's good to be back. Um, but yeah, and I, on a personal level, you know, I always like to share before I dive into my whole story um, that I do, I struggle with chronic illness. I have Lyme disease and a few autoimmune diseases. And that is a huge part, I would say, of my personal life and a huge part of my entrepreneurial journey and kind of why I'm doing what I am today. Um, so I always like to mention that just as kind of a personal mission in terms of empowerment for people with chronic diseases um, and how entrepreneurship can be such a gift to those people. So, Absolutely. I think we'll definitely touch on that because, I mean, everybody struggles with something, whether it's an illness or whether it's mental health or anything like that. There's always struggles in life. So being able to show up as an entrepreneur daily and navigate that journey on the personal side, it can be challenging. So hearing about your experience on how you do so and how you build such a successful company round two, um, yeah. that would be an amazing story to hear for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So let's start at the very beginning before the GT Studio. What were you doing leading up to creating the GT Studio? So what was your experience before? Yeah, so I will I will go way back um, to high school actually when I did start my first company, um, which was a it was a 
clothing line. So it was retail, totally different than what the GT studio is today. Um, but that was something I ran for two years and I ended up selling it my freshman year at the University of Texas, um, which was a crazy experience, um, especially at, what was I, 18? I guess I had just turned 19. So I sold it a month after my birthday. Um, so it it was a great learning experience. I learned more so in college what I did wrong in that business. Um, but I, I took a lot from that. And I would say that is when I fell in love with brand building. Um, I got to do it for myself, essentially. My uncle was a graphic designer. I've been learning Adobe since I was 10 years old. Um, so I've always had a passion for design, branding, marketing, the blending of the business side. I come from a family of entrepreneurs, so blending business with design. Um, and after I sold that company, I really never stopped building brands. I had a lot of local businesses reach out to me and ask who had done my branding and website for my company. And I told them that I had done it myself. And that's how just Honestly, it wasn't called the GT Studio back then, but how this whole business started, um, totally on accident, word of mouth. Um, and I did that all throughout college, just as my creative outlet and just for some extra money. Um, and when I graduated, I it's my whole health fiasco. I'll pause there, kind of hit my senior year of college, um, partially because I was way overly stressed. I was double majoring, you know, doing these brain projects on the side. Um, and really had no idea how to listen to my body, which I have learned through working and talking with other entrepreneurs that many entrepreneurs are like that and are typically wired the same. Um, so that was a big uh, learning curve for me to learn how to slow down and, you know, switch gears. And when I graduated, um, I thought that entrepreneurship was more stressful than a nine to five. And so I thought a nine to five would probably be my best bet in terms of working, but maintaining my health, um, partially because when I was running my first business, I was, you know, not sleeping, couldn't stop turning, you know, I couldn't turn off business. I was not sleeping. I was staying up too late. I was neglecting friends and I just was scarred from it. I was like, I can't do that again. Um, so I went actually, which is funny now, uh, into the financial services industry, which totally opposite <laughs> of what I had done before. Um, my parents were like, we had to bite our tongue so hard when you said you were going to go do that. Granted, I was doing branding and marketing. I was branding marketing communications for a wealth management group. I loved it. I learned a lot. Um, I actually got my securities licenses. I was kind of doing a hybrid of both. Again, business and design hybrid in my life is very strong. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, but I, what I learned in that from the chronic illness side was that was actually more draining to me than running my own business. Because one, you know, talking to people in the office, we were, I was getting in the office at 6.15 in the morning and getting dressed and not having the freedom to, if I woke up and didn't feel good one day to stay home. Um, and I learned a lot about myself and what motivates me and what lights me up and it was more so doing my own thing. Um, so around the time that COVID hit in Grace, I was still doing brain and web on the side throughout all of this as well. Um, I decided to take it full time. And during those two years from now, the past two years, I would say I have veered brand and web. I have veered into coaching because I did find myself oftentimes coaching the people I was doing brain and web for on how to do certain things in business because of my business experience and education and my, my brain just kind of works that way. Um, went into the coaching world, pulled back into the you know web design world like every entrepreneur does backwards and forwards. Um, and now I feel like we've really found our bread and butter as a brain experience studio because it really is the perfect blend of um, business and design. So that was a long winded answer, but it's kind of a crazy journey. <laughs> That's a crazy journey. <laughs> Holy smokes. Um, let's start at the very beginning of that and kind of dive in. As a very young business owner, like selling your business at 18, something that you've really put your heart and soul into, obviously being at a very young age, things are a little bit different. You take things a little yes. bit different. <laughs> um, how did you feel letting go of that business? I was really ready to get rid of it. If we're being totally honest, I had hit my point where I was like, I'm done with this. Um, it was, it was bittersweet. It was hard because it was my baby and it was something that 
I had worked really hard to build and I, I had worked really hard on the image around it. Um, and I was a little nervous passing it on that that would get lost. And if we're being honest, it did. Typically that happens when businesses are sold. And, um, but you know, I was ready to go on to my next thing. I knew I didn't want to be in retail my whole life. Um, I wanted to enjoy my college experience and, um, was ready to kind of see what was next for me, but it was a very interesting experience. And I learned a lot about being young and having people take you seriously, um, standing up for yourself, negotiations, all of that. Um, especially being as a young woman, that's even, you know, stronger. And it was, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was hard, but it was, it felt really good to cross that finish line for sure. That's insane. And I love how you kind of made your way naturally over to where you are today, right? Like you tried the financial industry (laughs) out of all things, which is hilarious, but it all taught you kind of what you liked and didn't like and kind of narrowed that path, getting you to where you're, you're currently at, which is so great, right? Exactly. That's the way to do it. That's how you learn. Yes. Yep. You learn and then you find your spot and you, you feel really good about it. So. Exactly. That's so funny that your family was like biting oh. their tongue. Like usually family would step in and be like, okay, oh, let's talk here. <laughs> What's yeah. Going on? Oh yeah. But letting they you kind know of- me, they're like, we have to let her, her try <laughs> this and do it. And granted, I mean, I really did. I learned so much that I, I still use in my business today. Um, I'm actually one of my clients is a wealth management group, so I'm using those skills again. Um, but it, yeah. It was kind of funny. <laughs> you never know what you're going to learn from all those different trial and error type mm-hmm. things um, that you can then apply in your business going forward. So I like, it's never a, like a loss of an experience. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like there's always something that will benefit you long-term wherever you end up. So Absolutely. definitely like look for those golden, golden nuggets um, in whatever you're trying to do so that you can better yourself going forward. Agreed. Agreed. All right. So let's talk about when you actually stepped into um, the whole branding experience um, business and what that was like growing that business. Yeah. So um, first of all, I was totally a breath of fresh air to have that be my full time thing. And that's where I'm going to kind of start is me really jumping into it was when I did quit my job and took it full time. Um, I actually and I hired very early on. Um, because I had been doing it for a while because of my health, I was like, I'm, I'm going to need some support here in order to, again, it's a capacity issue in order to kind of really grow this thing. Um, so I hired my first employee, Stacy, who's actually still with us today. She's amazing. Been with me for two years. Um, and it was a whirlwind of trying things out, figuring out my system, my own experience for my clients. Um, and it was interesting for me because that was my first time to actually go out and seek clients before it was kind of word of mouth you know I wasn't totally interested in if I didn't have a project I didn't really care but if someone came to me I said great um so that was my first time to getting on social media and putting myself out there as you know a personal brand but also a studio and for a long time I actually was just kind of promoting me as, as as a personal brand in a way we just recently started an Instagram account for our studio and it, there's a lot of self-development and finding yourself that comes with putting yourself out there in that way. Um, I, you know, I was investing in myself. I was having coaches and doing masterminds and group programs, um, all of which were so great. But you can also lose yourself when going through those things, um, you know, maybe following the direction that a coach tells you to go. But really, in your heart, you might feel like it might be this other direction and really finding the balance of seeking wisdom and and taking advice, but also um, putting your head down and and doing what you think you need to do. And um, I think that's the key really to to standing out in business. And I think the second I realized that um, was when things really started to pick up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Back to what you were saying about taking that leap. So Mm -hmm. how did you feel letting go of that structured kind of nine to five, this, the stable pay coming in and going full time with your business and then realizing that crap, 
now I have to actually like source out clients. I can't just sit back and let them come to me. Like I actually have to take this seriously. So what was your experience with that? Um, it was scary. It was another bittersweet experience. It was, it was very scary, but I will never forget the morning of my first morning of working for myself and waking up and being like, Oh my gosh, I can do whatever I want today. You know, when do I want to start work? What am I going to do? Um, and that's a really cool experience. Um, but it was stressful. I will say, um, I, I had a, another kind of unique experience of, I think because I had never put myself out there, especially in the local community of Fort Worth, I actually had people rushing to me the second that I said I was taking on clients, which I was lucky. And I think that was just because of my foundation I had built and doing it for six years prior um, or no, four years prior. But um, after that, there was a lull. You know, it's like, okay, the local people, I always tell people there's just this transition of working with people, you know, and my first clients were all, you know, friends of friends and people that I knew. And then there's this transition of turning into a real business and getting your first client that you don't know. Um, and that may not be local. And what I say, it makes you feel like people are taking you seriously um, when it becomes a quote, true business. And you're working with these clients that found you on Instagram, found you, you know, via your email list or something like that. Um, so it took a good, I would say six months before I started bringing in clients that were truly finding me on Instagram that were up in New York, North Carolina, you know, across the country. Um, and from there, we've been really lucky to kind of be referral based again, we need to ramp up our, our marketing again, but, um, there are definitely waves of seasons of that for sure. Yeah. I can definitely second that. Like the moment I launched mm-hmm. my business client within two days, got my speaking gig, another client, and then I booked out services. I had completely right. out. And now I'm in a lull again, right? Like it's yep. that ebb and flow kind of thing where you kind of just have to go with it. Um, you do. But always make sure that you are always focusing on like providing value and like creating your wait list and your newsletter and mm-hmm. stuff like that. So that when things do <laughs> die down, you have yes. something to tap into. But yeah, I'm definitely Absolutely. experiencing this. And it's, it's interesting. It's very interesting. It is. It is. It's very interesting. And it. I'm not sure if it ever stops. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about stepping into the CEO shoes of your business. Um, what did you struggle with kind of becoming the business owner now having an employee that is supporting you and relying on you for work and their salary and whatnot, and having to kind of work in your business, but then set time to actually focus on your business? What was that like for you? Yeah, it's it's definitely still a journey that I am on. Um, but so when I hired Stacy on our team, um, she was, it was as a contractor. Um, I would say the hardest thing in my industry about hiring out is people, I would say, come to me for my, my taste and my style, um, my unique background in business and being a designer. Um, but finding someone that aligns not only with your culture and your personality, but in my case, my style and my work and, you know, I needed someone who heard things that clients said and were able to produce something that was aligned with my aesthetic and style. Um, she caught on so fast. And now we finish each other's sentences. I would say she's totally my work wife. Like she, she just gets me and she gets my clients. And, and I think she's more talented than I am. I think she's fabulous. Um, but letting that go was definitely hard from a design perspective. Um, I have tried so many other, you know, hires. We have a team of, we're about to be a team of four now. Um, and I think this year is really when I'm truly like, I'm, I don't do client work anymore officially. Um, so I'm the creative director on projects and I am overseeing all the work that is done. Um, but my goal for 2022 is to really spend time writing our blog. I love to be on podcasts. I love speaking engagements. Um, that side of things really excites me. Um, research and education, all of those things. So that's kind of where I'm moving. And I think the biggest part of that is one building a team that culturally works really, really well together. We have a very, um, a flat hierarchy. We don't, you know, pass work up and down. It's kind of one person's the project lead. They have support, of course. Um, and that has worked really well for us and allowed me, I think, to step back quicker because I'm not 
the top of the totem pole. You know, I have people who are actually taking on the full project. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of it is just kind of forcing yourself to step back because it is your baby. Um, so I know it's hard for a lot of entrepreneurs, but um, it's been really great. That's good. Yeah, definitely get the right team members in place. Um, do the trial periods, make sure that mm -hmm. it's a good yeah. fit. Um, and definitely <laughs> invest the time into kind of creating that culture where it's, mm -hmm. it's going to make like an enjoyable experience for them as well as for you, but everyone communicates really well together. It's like a very motivated, driven team. That's like very cohesive. Yes. Agreed. And I think really on the culture aspect, motivating your employees, which this is actually a lot of what we do as a great experience agency, but getting your employees so pumped up and in love with your own brand like you are to where they are just driven to continue growing the business serve your clients really well um that i think is one of the best things that you can do as a leader in your business um and that alone allows you to step back and really focus more on the one year five year ten year vision what it's going to take to get there um and everyone else would be on board yeah, absolutely. So we'll dive into that a little bit more. Um, but I'd love to hear kind of what your tips and your advice would be for someone looking to scale their business. Um, so what would be the the first steps? Is it like growing your team at first, getting that support system in place? Um, obviously, once you have your actual business systems in place uh, <laughs> to make that easier to manage, um, right. or would it be like scaling your client roster first? Like what exactly is your suggestions? Yeah, that's a great question. And there's definitely um, a hybrid between the two. We are definitely in a place right now too, where I'm like, okay, we need to start taking on more clients. We need to continue to scale. But in order to do that, I do need another person, you know, so finding that balance of what's the transition period of us maxing out our capacity, you know, we'll work hard for three months just to bring extra clients in and then bring someone in and, you know, have another three month transition of building that client base up further. Um, I always tell people uh, in the beginning of scaling the business, internal work needs to come first in terms of really looking inside, okay, what do I really love about my business? Where do I want to continue? What's our bread and butter? What's our one, five, 10 year goal? Um, getting really, really sound on that before scaling. I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs scale too quickly and they scale almost in the wrong direction than what they think that they should be doing. And they may not know that. That's the hardest part is sometimes the first one to two years of business, there is a lot of trial and error before you do find your, what I like to call my bread and butter. Um, but I think building up the client base first and give yourself ample time to find the right person. So I definitely think, you know, you can start looking for someone early, um, but don't rush into hiring. That's my biggest advice. Um, I have done it. I've seen people do it. Um, and you don't want to be at your breaking point in terms of capacity with clients and looking to hire someone. Um, that's when you make rushed hiring decisions that may not end up working out so well. Um, so I think definitely I'm a planner planning it all out, looking at your capacity. Um, if you're a service provider, if you're selling products, that's a little bit different. Um, and, and kind of finding that balance, I think is really important. Yeah, absolutely. So running a business and then managing a team is like a whole other um, ball game, obviously. So I'd love to hear how you keep them inspired, how you get them to love your business as much as you do. How do you create that high performance culture? How how do you keep them on board with your vision and keep them focused on the work, um, even through the challenging kind of lull periods and whatnot as well? Yeah, um, I was actually just talking about this with someone recently that, that I think we're about to hire. And my approach to being a leader is a little bit different, I think, than what some other CEOs would say. And in that I'm very open with my team. I am, you know, they know what is going on in the business. They know, you know, maybe not to the cent how much revenue is coming in, but very close. They know what our prices are. Um, I'm getting them involved in business development efforts that I'm working on. 
Um, I think being really open with the team is one of the biggest things that has worked well for me. Um, a lot of people that I've talked to and coaches and mentors have said, well, why would you tell them that? You know, you're supposed to be the CEO and you just kind of tell them what to do. They don't need to know all of that. But I have found that by opening up, getting them involved in the vision, in the growth of the company has been really, really helpful. Um, outside of the fun things of just, I send them gift boxes with GT Studio, you know, swag is what most people would call it. Um, you know, different things that they can have on their desk that just make them really feel a part of our vision, a part of our mission, um, and a part of the brand. And um, just having a collaborative culture, we do co-working hours. Um, there's a lot of books out there that say team meetings are um, not productive. I think just even seeing people face to face because we are a um, remote team is very productive in and of itself. Um, and I just think the collaborative team culture is one of the best ways to just kind of keep people on board, um, telling them your, what your five year vision is, getting them excited about what's coming in. Um, I encourage my whole team to bring in business, you know, take on, you know, a higher role and um, that also can really help and incentivizing them, of course, to bring in business, um, has been really great too. What's really great is like when you get on board with a company that is going to be growing and that has so much potential, mm -hmm. there's so many areas of opportunity that could arise, right? So like, don't just stick like as an employee or as a team member of a, a company, don't just stick to what your, your role is, right? Like, mm -hmm branch out, try new things, like bring on clients, like do other things as well. Cause you never know, you might really enjoy it, but it also might be a really good fit for another role. Like there's so much expansion available. So I always like tell my employees that as well. I'm like, this is just where you're starting, but this doesn't mean that this is where you're going to stay forever. Like we can, things can change and things can evolve. And exactly. And I think really listening to your employees, like we have which it sounds like you kind of do too. We have quarterly meetings where I mm -hmm. talk to them like, what do you want to learn? What do you want to do more of? What do you want to see? What do you not like? Helping them find their zone of genius as well um, is really, really great and makes them feel really valued. Exactly. Because you're going to get, I mean, as an employer perspective, you're going to get the most efficient work done in the least amount of time when it's their zone of genius, right? Versus something that they have to learn or they're kind of drudging, doing type thing. You want them focused on where they really excel so that they can bring that to your business. So I love that you ask them kind of like, what do you like doing? What don't you like doing? Like, what are your ideas? Like have them involved in the conversation, which is really great. Yeah. Yeah. So let's dive into brand experience. Um, what exactly is this? Um, what's involved? What does it look like? How do you help people with this? Yes, we could have a whole episode on this. So I'm <laughs> going to try and keep it very like surface level. Um, but brand experience. So it's a word that has been around for forever. But I would say the concept of brand agencies or studios focusing solely on this is a little bit new. Um, but really, it's it's the sum of any sort of feeling, emotion, reaction um, that someone may have interacting with your brand. And that could be directly, indirectly from someone else talking about it. Um, so it's really a result that we're trying to achieve more than an actual thing. Um, and it's kind of, and this is just simplifying it, but basically unifying a brand strategy, the brand message and the brand identity across any sort of channel and throughout the entire customer journey. So it involves, involves a lot of customer journey mapping um, and just building really quality and consistent experiences throughout um, the whole journey. So we work with our clients um, and that's why, you know, I'm very careful of even calling us a brand agency because what we do is really deeper and further than a typical brand agency. Um, clients are typically with us for six to nine months. Um, and I would say they're probably in their 2.0 stage of business looking to go into their 3.0 stage. They have a brand, you know, they, their business is working. They've found their bread and butter and they're ready to really expand on it and take it to the next level. So we work with them on a really thorough brand strategy, brand research, market research, um, section of our process that typically takes about a month, month and a half. Um, then we are evaluating their current visual identity. Does it need to be tweaked? Does it need to be totally redone? Do we need to come out with this whole new message and new visual identity to really connect with the people that they're wanting to connect? You know, maybe there's a 
disconnect there. Um, then we move forward and typically are doing a website and copy or whatever it is. The project looks very different for every client. Um, doing the collateral, and those are kind of typical brand agency things that we're doing. But I would say where we really shine is the activation phase of our process, which we go in and we work with the employees at the company and we do internal communication campaigns, workshops, happy hours, different things once we've established the brand message, the brand visual identity to get everyone really excited. Um, so our whole, um, I would say, slogan or you know summing up what we do is really the best brand experiences start from within. And that has kind of a double meaning of, yes, it happens within the organization, getting them really confident and excited about the brand message as a whole. Um, we also work really closely with the founders and with the exec team. And like, that's where I kind of talk about like within like really truly their why, their mission, their values of connecting them on a, on a different, more grounded level with the brand. Um, and then we take it outwards from there. So we get the employees excited about it. We take it one level outwards to their current clients and customers, introduce them to this new brand message. Um, if it's not totally new, kind of strengthening that brand message, whether that's through marketing, PR. And then we take it another level outwards to finding new customers and clients. And that typically does involve a lot of marketing and PR. Um, so it's a really fun and interesting process that's totally different for each client. Because again, like I said, customer journey mapping is a big part of what we do. And everyone's customer journey looks really different. And so we have, you know, the fun part of going in and saying, okay, this is a really critical part in your customer journey. Let's build a really cool experience around it and designing that that's tying back to that brand message. Um, so there's a lot that goes into it, um, but it's so fun. And it, it really is the perfect blend for me of business and design um, because we look at systems and operations. We look at sales. We work with employees on HR and, you know, we, we're touching every little part of the business and it does require a lot of business knowledge on our team's part. Um, my whole team, it's kind of funny. We're all business and marketing majors. We're all self-taught designers. You would never know that. I hope seeing our design because everyone thinks we're just designers, all self-taught designers, very business focused, um, which I think is what allows us to do our job really well. I love that. Now, having worked with so many clients in the whole brand experience and mapping out their client experience journeys and whatnot, what are some key things that you've seen are missed that people should really look at in their own client experience journey and implement? Yeah, um, good question. I think a, I think the biggest problem I see is typically there is a disconnect between who the brand internally thinks they are and who their customers or clients or you know the greater audience thinks that they are. They may think, you know, we have it all figured out. Our messaging is great. Our content is great. And part of our process is doing interviews. And so we interview internal stakeholders and external stakeholders, asking them typically the same and maybe adding a few questions on each. And I have seen so many times where the external stakeholders are answering these questions in a way that's totally opposite of what the internal team thinks they are, that they would say. Um, and so then our job is to build that connection back and help them communicate that better. There's a lot of communication that goes into things. Uh, we even had a client where I was like, okay, the issue here is not the brand message. It is, we need a therapy session for the exec team. You know, a lot of it sometimes it's an internal issue. Um, but as for, you know, building out that customer experience, I think first making sure that that connection is really strong and clear um, and adjusting that first. But I think also putting yourself on the other side, thinking about the customer itself going through that journey, is there a lag time that they're in? This is just kind of for service providers. Is there a lag time where they're not hearing from you? You may be doing this great work for four weeks, but they're not hearing from you at all. What can you do during those four weeks to make them feel really taken care of, appreciated, or get them really excited about what you're working on? Is it a communication campaign that's dripping out with videos and kind of giving them behind the scenes over those four weeks of you know, what you're working on. And that can be totally automated. It feels very personalized and customized, um, but it could be a totally automated thing on your part that makes them feel very involved in the process. Um, you know, one thing that we do when we finish a brand design is we send them a gift with, it's the first time that they see their brand in person. And that's their one third of the project or project length with us, but they just get this gift out of nowhere. They get really excited about their brand and that keeps them involved and get really excited about the rest of the experience. Um, 
So there are so many different ways that you can do it. Um, but I think really thinking about the customer first and their maybe um, resistance during the project or anxieties during you know your ex- experience. If it's a custom product and it takes six weeks until they get it, you don't want to have crickets for six weeks while you're working on that piece of art or whatever it is for your um, customer and finding ways just to put a smile on their face. I think so much of it is about like the warm smile that people forget about. Yeah. And it's so funny because communication is like so simple, right? Like Mm -hmm. it's just so overlooked at times too, because I was just working with um, another company and crickets. And I'm like, yeah, just tell me when I can expect to have this back or tell me what the next steps are. Or like I reply to an email and I don't like, I'll get an email. I'll reply to it right away. They'll reply to it. And then I'll reply again. And then I don't hear anything for days. And I'm like, right. <laughs> like just, yeah, be more clear in the whole process, lay it all out for them. So they have a full understanding of what that experience is going to be like working with you. Keep them up to date. Right. Like <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I think that's too where the, which you hear about it a lot when it comes to marketing, like the omni-channel marketing approach of being in every sort of channel. And it's the same thing really for brand experience, having an omni-channel experience for your clients and making sure that you're connecting with them in so many different ways with using your senses, your physically, sensually, um, digitally, you know, however it is that applies to your business. Um, just finding a variety of ways to connect with your audience, customers, potential customers, um, I think is great. And as much customization and personalization as you can. Um, I actually have a blog post hoping to write it this week, we'll see, um, about automation and how automation and processes are so important, but they can also totally kill your business. So finding ways to build a great experience that feels very personal and customized while also giving yourself a break and you know automating things. Um, but that's why we do not have a streamlined process or temp- we don't use a single template with any of our clients because it totally ruins our experience. Um, and I think Again, there's a balance, but I love systems yeah. and automation. Don't get me wrong. Um, but there's there's a right and a wrong way to do it. Yeah, I definitely agree. Like I'm all for systems as an OVM, mm-hmm. like yep. technology, systems, automations, all that type of stuff. But I do agree that there needs to be a good balance. You can't over automate and and whatnot. It's going to take exactly. the soul out of your business, right? Like you, you can yep. create templates, but you should leave room for a lot of personalization, right? So that you don't exactly. start from like a base on everything, but still personalize it. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. It's a well, fine line. <laughs> it sure. is. It is. And it, you know, I, my brain, I think in a second life, I could have been an OBM because I loved that stuff. And I have to kind of find myself like, okay, you know, I can do, you know, templated emails and confirmations for things and things like that. Um, I'm more so talking about templates of like our brand strategy. We don't have a template for that because Every client needs something different and, you know, picking your battles when it comes to systems. Exactly. Exactly. I love that. <laughs> that's, that's a very good thing to keep in mind as you do build out your systems and whatnot is like, yes. what do you truly need? Um, that's actually going to yep. help versus that's going to create a negative experience. Exactly. Okay. So let's talk about health and wellness as an mm-hmm. entrepreneur. So as we kind of touched on a little bit at the beginning, you know, we, I mean, everybody experiences something to some degree, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But as an entrepreneur, we often lose sight of focusing on that inner work, focusing on taking care of our health kind of goes right out the window. And what I've personally even found is I found something that was working so well for me that I stopped doing it. (laughs) And now I'm like back at the place where I'm like, okay, everything's fallen off track. Now I need to get back on it, right? Like you don't stop. You have to continue doing it every single day. But given that you struggle on the health side a little bit, um, what is your experience kind of navigating the entrepreneurial world, running a remote team um, Mm -hmm. that is not just one team member, you have multiple team members to support as well as a thriving Mm -hmm. business but also having to navigate the days where maybe you're not feeling so well. Yeah, it is. A, it's definitely a daily challenge, but also I always say entrepreneurship can be such a gift to, it is a gift to everyone, um, especially when it comes to health and balance. It really can be such a gift because you have the control 
to structure your days how you want. Um, I say that in there some days where I am, you know, working 14 hours if there's a project that needs to get done. Um, and that's just life. I'm not going to pretend like I have a perfect two hour long morning routine and I wind down at night <laughs> perfectly every time. And, um, but I will say that a few things have really helped me. One, um, I'm a stickler for my schedule. I do not take calls Mondays and Fridays. I've actually now stopped taking calls on Wednesdays as well. Um, calls are really, I think, what drain me. And I think that's why actually being in the office drained me so much. Um, I was physically talking, I guess. I, I'm also, I'm an empath. I, I take on other people's energy. And I think that can be really exhausting for me as well. Um, so I batch my calls. I think that's one of the biggest things. I gear myself up on Tuesdays. I, you know, get dressed. Not today. Uh, I only had a few actually Zoom calls today. <laughs> but I typically, you know, I spend one to two days a week actually putting on makeup and getting dressed for my calls. Um, that helps me kind of get into that headspace. Um, having my morning routine is great. I typically don't start work until 10. Um, it's hard. My mornings are my product most productive times. And I, but I also know that I need to gear up for my day. I need to have my lemon water. I need to journal. I need to be really grounded. Um, I think one of my biggest things is being in that sympathetic, like sympathetic nervous system fight or flight. I very easily fall back into that. So starting off my day in a very grounded and calm way can help set that tone for my day. Um, I usually love to do a little workout in the morning too. If I don't work out in the morning, I don't do it at all. I'm not the type of person that can you know, stop halfway through my day and do a little workout. <laughs> I've tried. It's just, it doesn't work for me. And I think that's the biggest thing too, is everyone is so different in how they operate when it comes to productivity levels. What makes you feel grounded? You know, is it meditation, prayer? Is it going on a walk? Is it sitting still? Um, everyone is really different. So I think finding what works for you. Um, but I think the boundaries, the time blocking and starting my day on like a really positive note is, is what help, helps me the most. Um, and also not being afraid to say, you know what, it's three o'clock. I don't feel good. I'm just going to shut it down for the day. Of course, my clients come first. And if there's something I have to get done, I do, I will push through it and get it done for my client or delegate it to my team. Um, but really listening to your body and not pushing until you break because I've been there and it's not fun. No, and it takes so much longer to heal and recover once you do mm -hmm. get to that burnout or that break point. So avoid it at all costs. It does, for sure. And I think one thing that someone told me, and I'm a I'm a people pleaser by nature, and one thing that someone told me is like, they're not sitting anxiously at their email waiting for you to get back to them about this one little thing. Like, that's great of you to think that they care that much about you, but they're not doing that. So it's okay if you send it first thing tomorrow morning. And I was like, okay, you're right. You know, granted people are, if it's a brand design that's due, they're like anxiously waiting at their computer. But you know, if it's something little, they're like, just respond in the morning. You know, you, you don't feel good. Take a break. Um, I think just kind of letting that go um, is really important too. I think I feel like I relate to you so well because I'm the same way. <laughs> Calls drain me. Like yeah. aside from conversations like the podcast where I'm talking yes. about stuff with entrepreneurs, that actually like lights me up. But like mm -hmm. client yeah. calls and strategy calls and like just having to be on all the time, yes. I'm done. Like totally done for the day. Even mm -hmm. leading up to it, knowing that it's coming up, I'm like, yep. I need a nap. <laughs> so I totally I get that. <laughs> yes, it is very true. Yeah, um, I think it's important to recognize that about yourself too. And some people are so fueled by that and that's great and do more of it, but, um, find, run your business. Like you want to run your business. That's, that's, what's great about being an entrepreneur. Yeah. Make it your own tune yep. inwards, be self-aware of what works for you. Don't try to take on a routine that is working for someone else. Like make it your no, own for sure. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about your offerings. Um, anything that you have coming up, how do you support clients? Yeah. So we, we have our one, you know, kind of customized package that people can work with. I have gone through two years of offering 
you know, group programs and some little things on the side. And we have decided um, to go all in on just working with our small roster of clients because of how deep we go with our clients. We work with a small client group. Um, we do have some spots opening up end of April, um, actually early April now that we might be hiring someone. Um, so we are excited to be able to take on more clients this year. Um, we have a, we're bringing on someone I'm really excited about to our team. Um, so if you are interested in really expanding your brand experience and taking things to the next level you feel like you've kind of found your bread and butter um, and are ready to explode your company is what i like to say um then we'd love to to work with you and help you i do still offer 90 minute intensives um those are just kind of on occasion you can dm me on instagram you can um, inquire about them online as well if you're really just looking for a, a strategy session or just want an overview or audit of your brand experience. Um, and one thing that I would say to, to look out for this year is our blog. Um, I'm ramping up our blog again. We're going to be doing at least two posts a month all about brand experience um, and how you can really implement what we do for our clients within your own business. Um, so it's on our website, gracythomas.co. Um, and you can also sign up for our email newsletter. I'm always putting out not only the blogs, but also little nuggets of wisdom on brand experience, wellness, some random behind the scenes things. I'm, I'm like a Gwyneth Paltrow in a way that I'm always trying very strange wellness things. <laughs> you follow me on Instagram, you, you see that. Um, so it's a fun balance of business and personal. Awesome. And where do you hang out online the most? Where can people find you? Definitely on Instagram. We uh, kind of like I said earlier, gracythomas.co is my main account. It used to be my only primary account. Um, so now I call that my business personal account. That's where you can see anything behind the scenes. Um, I am educating people about brain experience on that as well. But I also show wellness, lifestyle, um, home interiors, all sorts of fun things on that account. And then our studio account is at the GT studio with the periods in between B and GT studio. Um, and that's where you can see our past work, what we do for our clients um, and learn more about how to work with us. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Gracie, for joining us today, for sharing your story and your advice. I am in awe of what you've created. I've been following you for quite some time. And I know that those tuning in are going to have so many takeaways from all that you've shared. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing everything today. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great. Jessica, and thanks for tuning in today to Love Unplugged, the podcast. If there are any questions or topics you'd love answered on the show, head on over to www.projectloveco.com and share your request with me. If you haven't yet, go to iTunes and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast and share it with a loved one. Your feedback means the world to me, and the community we've created is what fuels our discussions here. After all, this is all for you. Join me next time for another Unplugged Conversation.